counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he does meditate day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season. Its leaf does not wither, and all that he does he prospers. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. Hallelujah. So this psalm is an introduction to the rest of the psalms. And David, King David, although also being famous for killing the, the great Goliath, uh, is also well known for being the author of most of the psalms. Uh, he was a worship and a praise uh, leader here. And this uh, psalm, Psalm 1, serves as an introduction to the rest and it explains to us here that the person who delights in the law of God rather than sitting with, standing with, or walking with the wicked, the person who delights in the law meditates upon it how often? Every single day, day and night, not just once a week or 20 minutes on Sunday, but every day. The person meditates upon the law day and night. They're rolling the law and the word of God in their hearts and their minds and contemplating its beauty and its depth and its precepts and also its promises continuously. And it tells us that that person is a person who flourishes and prospers like the tree planted by the waters, those trees in the ancient Near East and Palestine that would be near the riverbanks that would be able to draw their sustenance from the streams and the rivers to flourish. And uh, this is the result of God being at work in a person's heart. One of the first things that you can recognize in a person when God is really at work and people are really responding to the work of God in their lives that they begin to develop this insatiable hunger for God's word. I think about the great uh, activist and reformer and a, a lay Methodist preacher, Frederick Douglass, who describes his conversion experience when he was born again. And one of the aspects among also uh, having a compassion and love even for those who were his enemies is he had this insatiable hunger to know and to understand the Bible more, to, to grow in his depth of understanding and application of the Word of God in his life. I uh, think about there's a guy who's an ER doctor who was a more or less agnostic atheist. His wife was an agnostic but had been raised in a Jewish family. His name's Matthew Sleeve, and he's done uh, some work uh, among Methodists and other denominations uh, as a Christian uh, to reclaim the benefits and the blessings of Sabbath. He's done a, a book called 24-6. I think we actually uh, did a study here at the church on that. But uh, he describes uh, his, uh, he began to hunger and to long for truth and he began to seek it out and he began to explore a variety of different religions, Hindu and Buddhist and others. And uh, he picked up at the hospital he worked at as an ER doctor. He picked up a Gideon's Bible and he began to read and he just couldn't get a, enough of it. And through that experience, he gave his life to Jesus Christ and continued to grow in this insatiable hunger. I remember being at a conference where he was speaking about reclaiming the blessings and the benefits of Sabbath and he was just talking about how he was up, you know, till three or four in the morning and just searching the scriptures and just feasting on the word of God. When we delight in the law of God, we're drawn to the word of God. We're drawn to the scriptures. Uh, think of this uh, story that the late Norm MacDonald just passed away. Uh, he, he was a comedian that uh, he did the uh, weekend update on Saturday Night Live. I remember seeing him a long time ago 
on Saturday Night Live here and there. And uh, he was also a man who was on a search for spiritual truth in, in many ways and uh, really found a much richness in the Christian faith. Uh, but Norm tells the story of a, a moth that went to see a podiatrist, you know, the foot doctor, the podiatrist. And the moth goes in to the podiatrist and uh, sits down, and the podiatrist says, uh, what can I do for you? And the moth begins to say, well, my life is just horrible. My life is miserable. My wife hates me. My kids hate me. Nothing seems to be going right. It just seems to be the same old, same old day in and day out. Life just seems to be meaningless and hopeless, and I'm feeling really, really bad, Doc. And the podiatrist looks at him and says, well, it sounds like you should have gone to a psychiatrist. Why are you here? And the moth said, well, the light was on. Oh. Oh. It, it takes you a while. <laughs> he was drawn to the light. I think of Psalm 119, 105. It says, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. The Word of God, if we're responding to God, the Word of God, like a light to a moth, will draw us, will draw us to it. You know, early Methodists, the early Methodists that began what they called the Holy Club. And you know, Methodists, the word Methodist was a, a sort of a derogatory, sarcastic, mocking term. Uh, but in addition to being called Methodists, they were also called Bible moths. They were called Bible moths, and it wasn't necessarily the light that people were referring to drawing them. It was they were drawn to the Bible like a moth to cloth, to consume the cloth. And they were drawn to the Word of God, and they sought deeply to understand better the Word of God and to grow in the Word of God. If you uh, read any of John Wesley's sermons or Charles Wesley's thousands and thousands of hymns but they uh, the word of god they just, it just came out of them effortlessly they had so filled their hearts and their minds with scripture and even their mother susanna and their father as well would have trained them and taught them the scriptures uh, you could uh, cut john wesley and he would bleed the Bible. Almost every other sentence and every other breath, if he's not quoting the Bible, he's alluding in some way to the Bible. They were called Bible moths. I think about John chapter 3 and verse 16 regarding the light. Jesus said in that famous passage where we are all very familiar with John 3 16, he says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world but in order that the world might be saved through him and whoever believes in him is not condemned but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only son of God and he says and this is the judgment that light has come into the world and the people love darkness rather than light. The people love darkness rather than light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his works should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out by God. The light of Jesus Christ draws us, and we get to know and understand who Jesus is through the light of Scripture. The Word written reveals the Word made flesh, which Jesus himself also taught us. If we're going to know Jesus, we have to know his Word. He was the Word of God made flesh and when we begin to hunger for that truth we begin to hunger for the very presence and spirit of god we will be drawn to his holy word and we'll meditate upon it day and night it's the new birth that really brings this to its fullness and to its consummation and makes it such a, a, a living and vital reality in our lives when we are born again as jesus taught nicodemus there in chapter 3 of John, 
when we are born again, this hunger for the Word of God uh, becomes greater and greater. And we, we find ourselves drawn more and more back to the light. And even to delight, even to delight in the law of God. Now, oftentimes people today think that stands in contradiction to the teaching of love or the teaching of grace. But the scriptures teach us that the person born of God should delight, delight in the law of God. See, this is uh, central to that very promise we find of the new covenant that we find in the old covenant itself. We find this promise of the new covenant that's revealed and unpacked very clearly in Ezekiel chapter 36 there where Ezekiel tells us that the person whose heart has been changed from stone to a heart of flesh uh, has this insatiable desire to obey, to keep the law of God. God doesn't throw away his law. He writes his laws on our hearts and he gives us the desires to delight in it. It's the new birth through faith in Jesus that makes the fullness of Psalm 1 possible. And we need the light. We so desperately need the light of God's word to shine into our hearts and into our lives and into our churches, into our communities. We need that light. I remember uh, when I was growing up, my dad, in addition to having a little country store, uh, and uh, in order to make ends meet, he started doing a little appli appliance business that kind of grew. He, did, he started dabbling into selling used appliances and working on appliances, refrigerators, and things like that. And I remember going with my dad on some of the, the calls that he would have, and there's a few that really that really stand out in me. I remember the one where we went and the, the person's washing machine wasn't working, and we got there, we were looking around, and dad was, uh, one of the most important tools that my dad, there's, there's three main tools my dad felt like he always had to have on him. Number one was his pocket knife. Any of y'all got a pocket knife on you out there today? I see a bunch of hands. My dad's, his philosophy was, if you don't have a pocket knife in your pocket, you're not ready for life. You're not ready for the day. Number two was a flashlight. He needed to have his flashlight wherever he went. And number three was a pair of vice grips. He needed his vice grips wherever he went. So what, one of those most important tools was the flashlight. And guess what job I had when I was a kid? I had to hold the light. And I had to hold that light just right so he could see what was wrong and what needed to be fixed. And I remember uh, holding that light and we were looking at this washing machine and we were trying to figure out what well, he was trying to figure out what was going on and I was just holding the light and daydreaming like a teenage kid probably would and then all of a sudden he said I cannot figure out what is going on here and I just looked over to the receptacle and I saw there was nothing plugged in thank God for the sunshine there shining on that I, I took the, the plug and plugged it in and lo and behold <laughs> it worked sometimes it's a simple fix but it's light that reveals to us the places that are dark in our hearts and our lives, and it reveals, and as it reveals, it also expels. The light of God's word is a discerner. It helps us discern. We saw from Hebrews chapter 5 that Hebrews talks about the need for us to grow in maturity as believers, and we have to grow to maturity. We can be become stunted in our uh, spiritual development to the point that we still are on milk when we need to be on meat and potatoes, if you will. And Hebrews says we need to be skilled and trained in the word of righteousness in order to be able to discern what is good and what is evil. And the light of God's word can reveal the places of fear in our lives. It can reveal the places of confusion in our lives. And it can bring faith and clarity. The light of God's word can reveal sin and selfishness in our lives, and it can bring sanctification and God's self-sacrificial love into our hearts and into our lives. The light of God's word can reveal the demons in our lives, if you will, and at the same time that it reveals, it expels, and it fills with the presence of God, God's 
Holy Spirit. It helps us to be a discerner. A discerner. Oftentimes we, we feel like and we're often told, well, you know, rules are bad. Rules somehow, we're told a lot of times, get in the way of relationship. You guys ever heard that before? Rules get in the way of relationship. Well, that's not really true, and that's not what the Word of God really Reveal. Sometimes people say, oh, we can just set aside our differences and we can just, oh, let's just follow Jesus. Well, we can follow that up with one simple question. Well, who is Jesus? If we have different and competing visions of who Jesus is, the Word of God, the light of God, the Spirit of God, the new birth, help the rules to become a living and vital reality in our life, not to bring cursing and not to bring hindrance, but, but to bring blessing and to bring peace. The rules are not the problem. It's our unwillingness or our inability to follow them or our confusion, if you will, our confusion about them. I'll give you a great example. You know, I'm coaching a coach pitch uh, team for Silas and also helping out with the t-ball team for Catherine. Uh, for this fall league this year, we have been playing by a, a, a set of rules that are more instructional for instructional baseball than competitive baseball. That, that's been the plan. And uh, so at the beginning of the year, apparently there was a, a meeting of all the coaches with a director named Wayne and Wayne explained, hey, we want this to be more instructional. We want to give the kids an opportunity to learn. So instead of playing by the normal rules where we have three strikes and you're out or five pitches max, we're going to just do four pitches regardless of whether they get three strikes or not. They get four pitches. And on the fourth pitch, if the, the pitcher, like me and Josh, we get out there and sometimes we get a little, little wild, don't we, Josh? We throw it a little, little high. It's hard. I, if I could just rear back and throw that ball wide open, it'd be a piece of cake, but what kid is going to hit that seven or eight years old? So you have to get it in there just right, and sometimes it's just way over their head, and we get a little off. So on that fourth pitch, if you have a wild pitch and they don't swing at it, then you give them another chance. You give them five. Or if they get a foul tip. Now, he's told us to make sure that the coaches confer on this before the game so there's no confusion. Well, we haven't had any problem until yesterday morning. <laughs> we ran into a little problem yesterday morning. So there was not clarity on the rules. The two head coaches, which I'm not a head coach, but the two head coaches did confer and they did agree, but apparently the other head coach didn't send out the memo to the grandmas and the mamas and the dads sitting in the stands. And I think a couple of their other coaches were a little confused about the rules that we're playing by. So when uh, they were thinking it was one set of rules and I was operating with another set of rules, somebody's grandma was ready to fight me yesterday. <laughs> Ain't kidding. <laughs> Barry Anderson. <laughs> Barry Anderson even came up to me after the game and said, boy, you about ready. I was about to get in a fight out there, weren't you? I said, no, I was I was just trying to clarify. When, there's, when we're playing by a different set of rules or when we're confused about the rules, it gets in the way of the relationship. And when we have clarity about the rules, when we have a desire to keep the rules, it can bring peace and harmony. The Word of God is the will of God, and it reveals to us. And as it reveals, as its light reveals, it also expels. It expels the bad things and makes room for the good things that God wants to fill our lives with. I said this past week, if you want to really clean up your life, and we need to dust off our Bibles. We need to get into the Word of God, and we need the Word of God to get into us, and we need to meditate on it once a week, day and night, every day, because this is about being everyday church and all together Christians. 
And like those early Methodist Bible models, Bible models that are drawn to the light of God's word and who are filled with the light of God's word to allow it to shine from our hearts and lives. So we want to make like a moth and go to the light. Pray with me. Lord, we thank you for your holy word today. Teach us, Lord. Teach us your ways. Teach us your will. Guide us by the light of your word. Wherever today, Lord, there is fear and trepidation, may your light dispel it and bring peace and faith. Wherever today, Lord, there may be selfishness and sin, we pray today, Lord, that your light will reveal it and expel it and make room for your holiness and love of you and love of neighbor. We thank you, Lord, for your forgiveness for where we have fallen short. And we thank you for your promise that if we confess our sin, that you are faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness, to make us new and to make us whole. And we pray this in Jesus' mighty name. And all of God's people said, Amen. 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 Stand as you're able as we sing. Soon and very soon.